Hi, everybody. My name is Aria Rao, and today on this edition of the lecture series, the August edition, we're going to be presenting Dr. Jennifer Johnson from Ferris State University, and she's going to be talking about how geography fits into the realm of the sciences. So I'm just going to let her take the floor. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Johnson, and I'm a professor of geography here at Ferris State. A lot of people don't really understand the discipline of geography because they think that it's just memorizing capitals or putting things on maps. But the truth is that geography really is a pretty diverse discipline. And it's, it's divided into two halves. About half of us are human geographers who study people and we really fit well with the social sciences. And about half of us are physical geographers who really fit better with the natural sciences. My background as an undergrad was that I was a math major and a physical geography major, and then I went to graduate school. And, and a lot of my graduate work in geography involves calculus-based physics, meteorology courses, all of those models that predict when a river is going to flood, where it's safe to build your house, soil types, how rock decays, how landforms form, when volcanoes erupt, how, what weather systems are going to do. There's a tremendous amount of math and science involved in that. And that's what the physical geographers are up to all the time. So it's really a, a very exciting discipline to be a part of because we get to do all kinds of things. And I always tell people, give me something you're interested in, I'll find you a geographer who studies it. And I really haven't failed yet. I'm not kidding. Geographers do all kinds of fun stuff. So I teach here at Ferris State and I teach weather and climate classes, I teach physical geography classes, and I've also been working on some research in the last few years that Aria asked me to tell you a little bit about. Most people these days when they hear about climatologists, which is what I am, it's my specialty in physical geography, they think global climate change and carbon dioxide, and, and you know, we can get into that a different time. But what I've been working on is researching something called the urban heat island. A lot of people know that, that people might have an impact on the atmosphere through the emissions that come out of their cars, but what some people aren't aware of is that we impact the atmosphere in a lot of different ways, not just through carbon dioxide. And one of the ways that we impact the atmosphere and impact weather is by changing the surface of the earth. Because the temperature of the air is really controlled by the energy that the ground is emitting into the atmosphere. So if the ground is really warm, then it'll put a lot of heat into the atmosphere and the atmosphere will warm up. And if the ground is really cool, then the air over it will be cool. So when we do something like take a forest or an agricultural field and we plow it down and we pave it with concrete and we put up buildings, that, that's not a judgment. It's not that those are bad things. We need places to live and park our cars and we need ways to uh, work with other people. But when we do those things, we really change the surface quite a bit. We take away plants that have a lot of water that they evaporate to keep the air cool. And those plants, they absorb sun and they turn it into food. And so they don't get hot. But when we replace it with pavement, the pavement is not a living thing first of all, so it doesn't absorb sun and turn it into food. It absorbs sun and it gets hot. And so now we have a surface that's much warmer than the forest that used to be there before. And on top of it, when rain falls on pavement, it doesn't soak down into the soil and later evaporate. It runs off and it gets channeled into a sewer system and disappears. Those are both things that mean that the air over cities tends to be warmer than the air over rural areas. And it's not always the case, but a lot of times the city can be quite a lot hotter than the surrounding, city, the, the surrounding rural areas. And we call this the urban heat island. There's been quite a lot of research done on heat islands in some of the larger cities. I worked on the urban heat island project, or at least parts of it, in Phoenix for a while. And in Phoenix, we would routinely see that the city maybe the, was about 13 degrees Celsius warmer than the area around it. So we know that big cities that have a lot of concrete and asphalt and a lot of human activity can generate quite a bit of heat. And in fact, we've seen cities like Atlanta, Georgia, I think it is, 
generate so much heat that they're starting to spawn their own thunderstorms. I've seen some radar of that. It's pretty impressive. So it's something for us to pay attention to because if the city is hotter, then it's going to be harder to cool buildings. And it might be that your lowest income population that has the hardest time paying for things like air conditioning happens to be in the part of the city that's the hottest and is most at risk. So there are a lot of important reasons why we might pay attention to the urban heat island. And what I've been doing with my research assistant over the last few years is studying to find out if small cities like Big Rapids, where Ferris State is located here in Michigan, might also generate heat islands. So Big Rapids is a city that has roughly 12,000 people in it. It's not very big at all. And we have maybe two blocks of downtown and, and some other more developed areas, but not really very much. And we're, we're very surrounded by a lot of forests and a lot of farm fields. So if you want to find out if a city has an urban heat island, you can do it in a couple of ways. So sometimes what researchers have done is they've taken the long-standing temperature record from the airport, which is where a lot of our weather data are collected, and they may put up one or two of their own stations outside of the city somewhere and then start comparing it to the airport because the airport's a lot of concrete and many times it's in a very urban area. So maybe we can compare it that way. Other times researchers might take a small instrument like this one that I have here. This is what we call a hobo. It's very tiny. It's not much bigger than maybe a lipstick tube. And they might put this on some kind of an instrument that maybe hangs out the window of the car and then drive around town and see how the temperature changes. It's a fun way to do it and it gives us a lot of really important information. One of the problems with it though is that the temperatures you're collecting as you drive around town are not all collected at the same time because you're driving and collecting them. So what, what my research assistant Cameron and I have done is we've taken about 28 of these little sensors and we went all over Big Rapids downtown. We worked with the city. We worked with the director of the park service. We worked with businesses and homeowners all around the city. And we asked them if we could hang one of these in their tree or on their light post or anywhere else that we found. So this is, a, this is a shelter that one of these little hobos would be installed in. And the reason we, we collect temperature data in a shelter like this, you'll see it on even the formal stations, the first order weather stations that collect our weather uh, data around the United States, is that the white keeps the sun from shining on the shelter and getting hot. You probably know this, you've been outside on a sunny day and your, your black shirt gets really hot in the sun. So the white reflects the sun and keeps the shelter from heating up warmer than the air around it. And then it's got a lot of louvers that just allow the air to flow. It's really important for temperature to be collected in the shade because otherwise this little hobo is going to sit out there and get direct sun and heat up. And it's just going to heat up itself and not give us the air temperature. So what we did was install 28 of these sensors around the city and in the rural areas around it. And we've been looking at the patterns that we got. We, we left those sensors up for about 15 months and we recorded the temperature at each of those locations every 15 minutes. We're still working on the data right now, but some interesting things have kind of come from it. For example, I was really surprised to find that on more than one occasion, our little downtown in, in Big Rapids, Michigan, was about nine degrees Fahrenheit warmer than a small uh, rural area that was about four miles south. That's a big temperature difference for a little town. And it tells me that even little cities can generate a lot of heat. So why does it matter? You know, in the summertime in Michigan, it really doesn't get that hot that often, but even so, you're gonna spend a little bit more on your air conditioning downtown than you might, or near downtown, than you might somewhere further out. I also looked at what went on in the wintertime, because I'll tell you, since I've lived here, there've been a lot of people that have asked me if the temperature sensor at the airport was actually accurate. They felt like maybe it wasn't. And I sort of suspected that maybe that was because they lived in an area that was maybe further into the urban heat island or further away in, in a more rural area than the airport. So what they were actually experiencing didn't match the official temperature for Big Rapids. And sure enough, as I just said, there's quite a lot of variation in temperature around the city. So 
that helps me to answer that question when people come to me and aren't trusting our local weather station. It's accurate. It's just as accurate for the airport and maybe not for the other areas around Big Rapids. And then I got to thinking, what about the kids who wait for school buses outside of town in those rural areas? We'll cancel school if the wind chill is negative 20 or below. So what I'm checking into now and what I'm going to be working on with this data next is where do we make that temperature judgment? If we say negative 20 or below in town and we decide that it's above negative 20 so we're not gonna cancel school, it's quite possible and I have quite a few maps to show that there are going to be areas outside of the city where kids are hanging out in temperatures that are below negative 20 because they're too far outside of even our very small urban heat island. So hopefully that gives you a little taste of at least one corner of geography and what climatologists do. You can reach me at jenniferjohnson at ferris.edu. If you ever have any questions, I'd be happy to talk to you and answer you. Other than that, thank you very much for having me, Aria. Alrighty, thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. That was a really great lecture that you had there. And thank you for providing your contact information. So if you have any questions to our viewers, um, our viewers can, you know, just email Dr. Johnson at yep. the email that she provided, or they can reach out to the Science Squad on our various social media platforms, or email us at the Squad at gmail.com. Thank you all for coming today, and be sure to share this lecture with your friends and family. And have a great day, and hope you come to our next lecture. Thank you.